Doamne ajută, fraților și soloilor! Salutare tuturor! Da, astăzi vreau să vă prezint un videoclip despre un film, Dragonul Descoperit. Și sunt comentariile mele, adică comentariile renașterii ortodoxe la filmul documentar Dragonul Descoperit de la Antuneric la Lumină. Da, este un film despre... Secretele din spatele artelor marțiale. Da, este făcut de un... Cred că de un grup neoprotestant, sau personajul principal este un creștin neoprotestant. Sau protestant, nu știu exact. Dar este foarte interesant, pentru că... I remember my first introduction to the martial arts. Prezintă exact de la început evoluția sa în domeniul artelor marțiale și modul cum l-a îndepărtat, un, cum l -a îndepărtat artele marțiale de familie, cum a divorțat și s-a reîntors la creștinism. And I dreamed of the possibility of doing those things which I had watched that little old Asian man demonstrate with such ease. But little did I realize the darkness into which this path I was now following would lead, nor the lives that my decision that day would influence and forever change. Today, the martial arts are looked upon as sport, as self-defense, health and fitness. And often as a form of public expression, but is this the way it has always been? Who are these men and women who dedicate their lives to these arts and amaze onlookers with their incredible feats of almost superhuman strength and speed? How are these abilities attained? And from whence comes the philosophies and spiritual teachings which permeate these practices? Why do we see such a growing influence of Eastern philosophy and mystical practices within the Christian Church over the last 10 years? Are these practices focused merely on athletic ability, or are they being used to prepare mankind for the coming of a world teacher and a thousand years of peace? Are these Eastern mystical arts based merely on human talent and ability, or is there something much darker and more elusive working behind the scenes? The first time that uh, that I was exposed to martial arts, I don't I don't remember where I was, but I remember I saw something on television, and it was a it was a picture of this little Chinese man, and he was demonstrating martial arts ability, and he took an egg and set it on the ground and stepped up onto the egg and stood there. And it was only for, you know, 20 seconds, but he stood on top of that egg and then he stepped off. And I was a little child, that's always stayed in my mind, you know, when I saw that, because I thought, wow, you know, that's almost like a miracle, you know, that he could do that. When I was 12 years old, uh, my parents went through a separation and a divorce. And it devastated my life. Um, I became very rebellious, I was angry. You know, I know that neither one of my parents ever intended to hurt me, but I felt, I felt abandoned. I felt rejected. I felt like I wasn't worth fighting for. And during that time, I began really searching for some purpose to life, for some reason um, to be a man. I mean, what is the reason for being here? And I remember talking to my mother one day about possibly looking for a martial arts school because that memory that of seeing that picture always stayed in my in my mind and we found a school downtown in the the city where I live and we went we went down there one evening after she got Da, deci uh, personajul principal povestește despre to this day, that walk, părinților săi despre faptul we că down the street it was a downtown rough part of the town and The dusk was coming in, the only lights uh, were the street lights and they da, were just beginning to glow. Furios, no mânie și... And while we're walking down there, I mean, you can see like the pool hall, da, the lights on there, and the, the night light was starting to awaken. There's all these old brick buildings and warehouses. Uh, and we're walking down the sidewalk and all the shops closed, all the little mom and pop stores. 
And we finally came to this building, this old brick building. It was probably three stories, maybe four stories tall. And I remember when my mom and I were walking up, we're looking for this door for a name of a school. And we were expecting it to be, you know, like it is today, you know, this really elaborate, nice, modern. And we found this little doorway. I mean, it, was, it wasn't even a full door, a tiny little wooden door, and it had the name of the dojo on the door. So we opened the door up, and as soon as we opened the door up, we could look up and we could see a light at the top of the narrow staircase. And my mom and I started walking up that staircase. And as we're walking up, we could hear the shouts, uh, the kia, uh, the students, you know, yelling. We could hear, you know, the instructor, you know, commanding the students what to do. And I mean, I remember feeling my heart begin to quicken. And I was like, yeah, I'm finally here. You know, something I've dreamed about, you know, forever. And we got to the top of the steps and we stepped into the studio. And here's this man um, in a white uniform with this old black belt. I mean, it was, you know, just faded with age. And he's giving these orders to these students. And there was the utmost feeling of respect. I mean, all these students are doing exactly what he says, exactly when he says it. And they're doing these, these forms, these katas, you know, punching and blocking and um, the kicks and the yells. And I remember trying to take in the whole scene. Um, there's calligraphy, you know, Japanese calligraphy and Okinawan calligraphy on the walls. And there's pictures of old masters and people that have died, you know, the founders of the art. And we stayed there for probably 35, 40 minutes, you know, watching. When the instructor got a break, he came back over to us and, you know, started talking with my mother and I. I had to have my mom's approval, you know, to do this. And I remember the instructor, you know, talking about the classes and the schedule, and I was getting so excited. And then we got down to the end of how much does it cost? And this was back probably 83. Um, 82, somewhere in there, and he tells us the price, and you know, I saw my mom's eyes, and I knew it was too much, you know, because we were very limited on our income with my mom and dad being separated. And, uh, you know, we thanked him, told him we would think about it, and we walked out of uh, the dojo. We walked back down those steps. I remember as we were walking down those steps, and I, I stepped out onto the street, it was like the wind had been taken out of my sails. I thought, you know, here this dream was, and I thought this was it. And uh, now I knew there was no way that we could do it because the price was just too much. So my mom and I are walking down the street and I could sense that my mother felt uncomfortable. Not just about the price, but more importantly, she felt uncomfortable about something in the dojo. And even though I was so excited about, you know, participating and becoming part of this, I had sensed the same thing. It was. No, but it's Mama. I was raised as a Christian. You know, we went to church every Sabbath, and yet there was something about what we had witnessed, about the the power and about the the violence, about the the actions of the art that just didn't match. And I couldn't put my finger on it, and it didn't make me feel good, so I just dismissed it. And I knew my mom couldn't dismiss it. So we went home that night and I didn't ask her what was on her mind and she didn't tell me, but I knew. Dacă este okay ca a friend of mine, um, their older brother was uh, there at lunch. He was uh, a junior of a years ahead of me. I was in high school and he started telling about this martial arts school that he had found, a kung fu school in the area. And he had been training there for you know probably a year or two, and he was talking about it. And I just I asked him. I said, "Well, how much does it cost?" Da, asta nu, asta nu, nu, nu vreau să spun că. Da, copilul poate să și aleagă. And I said, well, "What kind of school is it?" Vocația, să descopere vocația, să meargă pe calea vocației. Dar. He said, "The guy's a Christian." He said they have a Bible verse every night. E, so intuiția mamei de multe ori este um, foarte importantă. Și mama lui se pare că a fost contract. foarte intuitivă referitor la I was, I was, I was so artele marțiale. Adică, sincer, acum vorbind, artele marțiale și doctrina noastră creștină 
Creștinismul și iubirea necondiționată în care se propovăduiește în ortodoxie și Dumnezeia după har sunt două chestii toate opuse, adică filozofia artelor marțiale cu filozofia creștin ortodoxă cu trăirea creștin ortodoxă sunt două lucruri care nu au nu pot zic că chiar n-au nimic în comun, dar au foarte puține lucruri în comun, adică sunt două spiritualități total, total opuse. Intriguing, mystical, you know, ideas, thoughts of the martial arts. So we got there, and I began training. And this school was very unique. They they based rank on your ability, and there were only four ranks. You had white, green, brown, and black, and you could get a stripe in between, which meant you were just a, a little bit ahead of the other guys. But in The only way to achieve rank was fighting. And we fought full contact, you know, with boxing gloves, 14, 12, 14, 16 ounce boxing gloves. And we also fought what's called empty hand or open hand. The thing that really intrigued me the most about this school was is because it was a Kung Fu school, the fighting when it was done open hand was based on what's called animal styles. So if someone was a tiger stylist, if they were good, when you watch them spar or watch them fight, You would see them mimicking, you know, the motions of a tiger with their hand positions, with their blocking, with their stances. Um, if someone was a snake style, you would see the heads of the snakes or the heads of the cobra as they were fighting. You would see the techniques. Um, and then the instructor, his primary style, although we taught all of them, his primary style was praying mantis. So when they would fight, you would see the hand positions like the praying mantis. And, The Manus was a close-in style. It, it drew its opponent in and crushed them on the inside. And I was so overwhelmed, you know, after that first night of seeing all these things and, and the guys, you know, kicking. And I looked and I thought, you know, that's power. That's not just power, but control. It was like my life felt so out of control. I felt like I didn't have any control over anything that was happening to me. And this is what I wanted. I thought, that's what I want. I want to be able to control my circumstances. I want to be confident. I want to, to believe in myself. I want to know that whatever I set my mind to do, I can do. When we're there in class, you could tell the, the order, the hierarchy, if you will. You know, the white belts were the beginners, and they listened to the green belts, and the green belts were terrified of the brown belts, and the brown belts didn't want anything to do with the black belts. And there was this, this pecking order. Um, of authority, the thing that intrigued me or caught my my attention to want to make green belt, to desire that green belt was one night a week at 10 o'clock after all the other students had left the school, those that had made green belt were allowed to come in to the school and they would shut the door on the training room and they got private instruction from the, the Sifu, the teacher. And no one was allowed to, to see or to talk about what was you know taught in there. So it was like immediately, it's like, what's behind the curtain? I mean, I want that. And you saw the green belts, their ability. And you saw what they could do. So you wanted to have that ability. And, and you realized the only way that they had that ability was because of that special training they were getting, you know, behind closed doors. Well, after I made green belt, you know, I got to go into that first class. And I remember um, there was sort of a, a basic initiation when you stepped into the class, into that high rank class. You lay down on the on your back on the floor. They'd raise your shirt up, and every single one of them would get two slaps with an open palm on your belly, as hard as they felt you were able to to handle. And nobody was uh, nobody was going to get seriously injured. But I can remember I had marks on my stomach for you know four or five days afterward. I mean, it'd bring blood to the surface. But then you felt like you're part of something, like you you had earned it. So I stayed there and I trained for approximately two years. Um, we had Bible verse each night. You know, there were people that gave their hearts to the Lord, made professions of faith. But then I got to where I was graduating high school and my dad offered to put me through college. He said, Eric, if you'll move down here with me, you know, outside Chattanooga, he said, I'll pay for your college. So I moved. 
I hated to leave that school because it, you know, it meant so much to me, but that was the only school I'd ever you know, trained in. I didn't know there was anything else out there. And we were told that, you know, we're number one. This is the best school. There's no other styles that do it like we do. And I thought, well, this will give me a chance to find out if that's true. So when I, when I moved uh, down to Cleveland, Tennessee, right outside Collegedale, um, I started looking for a school. Went through the phone book, and you can open the phone book up and there's all these advertisements, you know, and the bigger the town is, the more schools there are, the more dojos and studios. And, you know, some of them would, would list at the top, you know, the instructor. This is how many you know, degrees of a black belt he is. He's a fifth don, he's a sixth don. You know, and you look at those and you go, wow, this guy's got a lot of experience. Um, and then they would list the, the different styles or arts that they would teach. And almost all of them said, you know, self-defense, self-confidence, self-esteem. So it really, they lured you in. They knew what people were lacking. I look back now, you know, after my conversion, and I realize that all of those things that they offer can truly only be found in Jesus Christ. It can only be found in absolute faith in the Word of God. But I wasn't there at that point. Um, I'd walked away from church, walked away from God when I was 14 years old. Um, I just got, I got tired. I said, you know, there's no power in this. I go to church every week. I'm hearing the same verses over and over again. Um, but it didn't change my life. You know, I went to church and I heard sermons, but it didn't help me deal with the problems I was having with, you know, girls and with lust, or it didn't help me with the problems with, you know, the guys at school that were threatening me or, you know, the bullies. So in my mind, I thought, you know, church must be a good idea, but it's not helping me in my practical everyday life. I can do something else. So in a very subtle way, the enemy was moving me from one religion into another. I began to look for those answers in martial arts that I wasn't finding in the church. And unfortunately, the answers were there. I mean, I felt like I was getting control. I, um, I wasn't afraid of the bullies anymore. Um, I became very um, adamant. My mouth sometimes would get ahead of what my body was able to do, but there was a, a pride that was growing within me about the abilities that I was learning in the martial arts. I went to a couple of schools while I was there in Cleveland. Um, the first one when I was at college was a, an Ishinru school. I trained with them for two and a half years while I was there in, in college. So I heard about a place, um, a class that was held at the YMCA. My dad told me, he said, Eric, try the YMCA. I thought, Dad, I mean, there's not going to be anything at the YMCA. I mean, that's like kid stuff. So I went to the YMCA one night, and I walked into a class that's known as Burmese Bondo, or Bondo Boxing. And it's from Burma. They had a great influx of the influence from the Chinese above and from the Okinawans and the Japanese. So it was like there was a mesh of these uh, Oriental ideas when it came to combative arts. Um, they believed very heavily in full contact. They did boxing, they did empty hand, and they did animal styles. Although they were different animals than what I was used to with the Kung Fu, it was, it was similar. It was very easy to adapt. I trained with them for, uh, for five years before I made black belt in that style. And during that time, we went to a, a national kickboxing tournament. It was probably the biggest event that I'd ever been to personally. There were hundreds of people there. And I remember I was a nervous wreck, you know, because I'd never fought in front of that many people. And they've got spotlights on you. And, and it's just, you know, it was really nerve wracking. But then when you get out there, and I remember stepping into the ring, um, and I was looking around at all these people that were around me, and they've got a card girl walking around, you know, in a bathing suit holding up a number, and, and I'm thinking, is this real? And, you know, there was butterflies in my stomach, you know, how am I going to do? You know, all these people are watching. And then the other guy, my opponent, climbed in the ring on the other side. And when I looked at him and our eyes met, everything else was gone. It was like, I didn't see anybody anymore, I didn't hear anything, the crowd was gone. All that mattered was the battle that was in front of me. And when I look back at that, at that fight, it really changed me. And when I came back, I mean, there was a, a newspaper write-up about uh, me and the other team members from our, from our martial arts studio um, that had made you know, the grade, that had, had achieved. 
and pride was built a little bit more. After five years of hard training in the Burmese style of Bondo, I achieved black belt and my instructors encouraged me to begin teaching the art to others. But there was something missing, something of which I had not attained. And shortly thereafter, I decided to return to my first school, for I wanted to test my skills now in the place where I had begun. But little did I realize the spirit that was influencing my decision, nor the darkness into which this path I was on now led. During this time, I saw the fourth man in the history of our school achieve black belt. It was the first ceremony of this type I had ever before witnessed, an event which inspired me with awe. So when I came back to the art, you know, I started back where I was as a green belt, and within six months I'd made advanced green. You know, within another year and a half I'd made brown belt. And the instructor knew that, that I wanted to be able to teach. I wanted a black belt in this style. During that time, I got to see that advanced brown belt make black belt. And uh, it was the first ceremony that I'd ever been to like that. Candles, and it was very intense. And I remember the instructor looking at me as this other man was being promoted. And I knew that's gonna be me one day. I'm gonna make black belt here. In 1999, I was the fifth person to make black belt in that school. Fifth person in almost 30 years. And it took me 14 years of training to do that. You know, while I was training in these arts, um, most of that intense uh, internal training came in the high rank class behind closed doors. When we trained in that class, there was an idea that was introduced to us. And that was the idea of something called chi. Now that term is, is thrown around even on sitcoms today. It's everywhere. It's in health magazines. It's in dentist offices. But back in the 80s and the 90s, this was not something that was thrown around to just everybody. And the way that it was described to us by our instructor was this chi is something that God put within man. It's internal strength. It's something that you have to learn to pull from within you and to focus it into your techniques whether that be kicking a bag or punching somebody or being able to do 200 push-ups without stopping. You had to take this strength from within and draw it up and put it into whatever you were going to do. And that I, I knew, this is what we need. This is the key to why those brown belts and those advanced brown belts and black belts can do the things that they do. And you know, we see nowadays you know, in, in films, uh, Hollywood films as, as well as documentaries, you see men breaking huge, you know, 500 pound blocks of ice or breaking solid timber, you know, boards, not these little pine boards with pencils, you know, inserted between them, but real things. So we asked about, you know, how do we learn this? And I can remember the instructor telling us, you know, as an advanced green belt, he said, this type of training is reserved for black belt. He said, I can show you pieces of it, how to get you ready for that, but you da, won't really learn noastră... about how to tap into the chi uh, until after that. I don't know if you know that chi or chi, which is a chi, which is a Japanese, which is a Duhu Sfânt. But there is a big difference between chi and chi or chi, which is a Duhu Sfânt. We were warming us up to this idea as students for a couple of weeks. Well, we got there and I would face off with my partner. You'd pick somebody that was equal rank as you. We started off with smacking each other in the face. And he would smack me and I would smack him and you'd start off with something like that. And it increased. Each smack was harder. So he'd smack me a little harder and I'd smack him a little harder. And you're looking at each other, staring each other right in the eyes. And it was harder and harder. And this went on for five minutes until you keep getting harder. And you could see the green belts that were nervous. They were taking it easy on one another. And then you'd see the brown belts where they were, I mean, just hitting each other hard with an open palm. And they were feeding off of one another's aggression, almost like sharks. And so we would do the face and then we would do the arms and we would do the legs. And then we would bring out a board. And usually it was a one inch uh, solid um, oak board or hickory board. And you would stand there and tense up your body and allow them to strike you in the stomach. And you had to channel your breathing. So when you're being hit, you breathe out and, and very intense. 
And our instructor told us that this was the first step in learning how to how to tap into that, that internal strength that was supposedly inside of us. Something that happened that night that, that really intrigued me, and I look back now and I understand it more than I did then. He did not allow us to fight after we did that class. And normally we always fought after hiring class. There was no fighting allowed. And years later I asked him about that and he said, because you're too keyed up after going through that, you'd hurt each other. He said, you wouldn't hold back. So that, that stuck in my mind. In the martial arts, there is a division between styles. Some styles are called internal, some styles are called external styles. The external styles are styles that focus on really developing the physical body, while the internal styles focus almost intensely on breathing and being able to tap into the chi, into this internal strength. Within those styles, the Japanese have a term that's called Bushido. And all martial arts is based on that term, Bushido. It means the way of the warrior or the warrior spirit. It's telling you, right off the bat, it's telling you this is what we're training to become, to become warriors. Only it's not warriors for God, for Jehovah. It's warriors of the flesh. Satan delights in war, for it excites the worst passions of the soul, and then sweeps into eternity its victims, steeped in vice and blood. It is his object to incite the nations to war against one another, for he can thus divert the mind of the people from the work of preparation Christian circles, many times Christians will ask questions. Am la nivel subliminal este antrenat de vii războinic. Is there something wrong with our military? What about our military? What's wrong with them knowing how to defend our country? What about law enforcement? Adică, de exemplu, te apuci de arte marțiale ca să ai mai mult autocontrol, ca să ai încredere în sine, dar de fapt, în sine a dat de vii un războinic. Military, training, and defending the helpless than what is taught in martial arts. We've only seen military in our country since the 1950s being introduced into martial arts. Since the founding of this country, we've had uh, warriors, we've had armies, and these armies never were trained in Eastern mystical combative techniques or spiritual techniques. Only since the 1950s, after World War II, was the martial arts brought back with our soldiers. Many of them, when they were stationed uh, in the war in Okinawa, they picked up the idea of the martial arts. They saw men that, you know, traditionally are smaller in stature, smaller in build. They saw these little oriental men able to do seemingly impossible or superhuman feats of strength and speed. So when they saw this and they brought it back with them, we started seeing an influx of Asian masters And first it was the Japanese and the Okinawans um, teaching judo and jiu-jitsu. And then it began to develop farther in the 60s. We started getting more of the, the Eastern mysticism with yoga and the hippie movement. All along that timeline, while these, these arts, these mystical ideas and philosophies are being brought into our country, the media is picking up and running rampant with it. We're seeing martial arts movies. You know, I remember, you know, Bruce Lee, Enter the Dragon. That was like the greatest martial arts movie that anyone had ever seen. Um, we had the Green Hornet. We had David Carradine with Kung Fu. And as we progressed in the, through the 70s and the 80s, we had Chuck Norris movies. So these heroes were being put before the minds of our families and our children. Even traditional fundamental Christianity was now looking at what was once considered esoteric and occult power as, is this physical? Is this a physical thing that we've just not learned how to tap into yet? So with those movies, I mean, I was intrigued. I mean, because we could do these things in real life, we always went to the movies to see, you know, how they were portraying, you know, the arts we were practicing. There was one man in particular that really set the stage for modern day martial arts. His name was Gichin Bunokushi. This man um, was one of the founders and fathers of modern day karate. Nah. And I remember seeing his quote in books uh, on dojo as we were practicing. There was one man in particular that really set the stage for modern day martial arts. His name was Gichin. 
Da, ghici în Funacoș, care da, este considerat, ca să zic așa, fondatorul altelor marțiale moderne, da. Dar artele marțiale își au uh, începutul mult, mult mai devreme. And I remember seeing his quote in books uh, on dojo walls and oftentimes when parents take their students, little Johnny and Susie, in to sign up for karate, this quote is the one that wins them. Funakushi said something. He said, martial arts is not about winning or losing. It's not about competing and defeating your enemy. It's about the perfection of the character of its participants. And when you, when you hear that, it makes you feel, wow, that's what I want for my children. I want to perfect their character. I want them to be self-motivated, self-disciplined, self-controlled. I want them to have self-esteem, as I do for my children. What they don't realize, and what most of the instructors won't show you, is the cover of his book, his master's textbook on the martial arts. And when you see the cover of that book and the image that is on there, You begin to realize the character that is actually being developed. Da, parcă se amână cu tot acum, la modă cu un reptilian. A years ago when I was looking at that image, I thought, Aceasta imagine, nu? I mean, you don't just la modă reptilieni în ziua de astăzi. Vorbim despre reptilieni. An image of rage and power for no reason. And as I researched and found that image, it was an image of one of the 12 Asian zodiac gods. So it was this image that was being portrayed through the deci, stați puțin, că e foarte important aici. Da, seamănă parcă cum spun, cu un uh, extraterestru reptilian sau cu un... Că tot acum ne vorbesc pe extraterestri despre cei din constelația Dragonu. Această imagine, clar. Looking at that image, I thought, where did this come from? I mean, you don't just make an image that looks blatantly demonic, a, an image of rage and power for no reason. And as I researched, I found that image. It was an image of one of the 12 Asian zodiac gods. So it was this image that was being portrayed through the punching, the kicking, the fighting, continually training in the art of war. Martial arts means the art of war, martial art. So, is this the character that we want to develop in our children and in our own lives? Bună întrebare. I remember as I was training, when I was growing close to making black belt, the first dawn in Kung Fu, or black sash, as the Chinese would say. I was fighting with my greatest competitor. He was another advanced brown belt. And that rank took the longest. It was over two and a half years to go from advanced brown to black belt. And we fought every single week. This guy outweighed me by close to 120 pounds. And through the training, we had learned how to push through, no matter what the obstacle was. When the day came, and I was fighting this opponent, this, uh, this other advanced brown belt, I remember the instructor stopping the fight was in the afternoon and looking at me and he said that's good enough my instructor pulled me to the side and he gave me a date he said how does may sound and i knew what he was talking about and he just smiled and for the next few weeks he didn't even bring it up when that day came i drove up to the school you know with my wife and children there was going to be all these alumni of the school older high ranks brown belts advanced brown belts and green belts that had, had been there from years before coming to support and to be a part of the ceremony. When we got out of the car, my instructor, my Sifu, he had one of the high ranks come and take my wife and children and lead them into the school. And he took me separately to a separate room outside of the school. And he sat me down and he told me, he said, Eric, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, you may not understand this now, but you will one day. He said, what's about to happen to you, what you are about to participate in? is more like a marriage than a promotion. And then he walked out of the room and he left me there to think. As I came into the school, you know, an hour or so later after the ceremony was all set up, there was a path of candles. And the instructor would walk in 
and then the higher ranks, the brown belts and advanced brown belts. And then each one of the green belts would walk in with brown belts, carrying a candle, setting it down, setting, as it were, a path of fire that you walk to achieve this moment. When I came in after and walked down that path, I came in in front and the, the school was full. There were hundreds of people there. And I sat down in front with my instructor, you know, in a lotus position with the cross legs. And he sat down there in front of me and I sat down. And he gave a speech. You know, he told about, you know, the achievements and the difficulties that I'd overcome. As he was doing this, I looked and there was the traditional Asian teapot for the tea ceremony. There was also two candles there. And he told me, he said, when we do this ceremony, he said, you reach up and you put the candle out with your finger. And afterward, we did the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony was one teapot, him pouring and me pouring, and then us both drinking from the same water. And that was very symbolic. What it meant was is that his teachings were now my teachings. His life was now my life. His spirit was now my spirit. It made us and joined us as one. After the ceremony, we had a dinner. And I remember at the dinner, I mean, there was all these people, all these family members and students da, there. Monismo, and I was so used to, from my upbringing, so I started to go over and help the high ranks, the green belts, to serve people. And I remember the Grand Master came over to me and he touched me on the shoulder and he pulled me to the side and he said, you're not part of that group anymore. You're not supposed to be serving. He said, come up here and sit. So I went up to the table and sat down with the other black belts. And the Grand Master sat beside me. And he said, you are to be served. And all these green belts began to bring the food to us. And at that point, it was like the Lord sent up a red flag. Something's not right about this. This is exactly opposite from what God's Word says. Correct. Pentru că Iisus a spus în Evanghelia după Luca cel care vrea să fie să fie lider, să fie slujitorul tuturor. Și până la urmă, faptul că, da, ai ajuns la centura neagră, asta nu înseamnă că poți să-i servești și pe ceilalți. Adică, acum trebuie să fii tu servit. Deci, vedeți? Principiul ierarhiei În artele marțiale. Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells us, You know that the princes of the Gentiles and the unbelievers exercise authority and dominion over them, and they that are great or powerful exercise authority upon those that are weak. But it shall not be so among you. For whosoever will be great among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall be chief among you Let him be your minister. These thoughts were, were racing through my mind. You know, why am I now being served when I should be the one that is serving? Vedeți despre ce vorbesc, da, asta este, cred că, că Evanghelia lor, celor din martorii lui Jehova sau din Duhul ăsta neoprotestant. Dar în artele marțiale, deci este clar principiul ierarhiei, pe când noi, învățăm asta din creștinism, este că It's a way of life. Liderul, cel care vrea să fie lider, este ajutorul tuturor și servește oamenii. Nu invers. That I could achieve and, and progress in the arts, and my instructor came up to me and he asked me a very, a very pointed question. And I noticed that something had changed between he and I from that ceremony. Now, instead of him looking down at me, it was, it was as though a wall had been taken down that kept the student away from the master. And he asked me a question. He said, Eric. He said. What is it that you want from the martial arts now? Now that you've achieved black belt, you know, where do you want to go? And I told him very plainly, I said, I want what you have. I want the abilities that you have. The things that I had seen him for those 14 years do that seemed magical. My instructor encouraged me to begin training in other arts. 
Um, my primary focus had been on full contact and on the animal styles. He began to encourage me to train in other arts, in Aikido, in Judo, in the Okinawan styles, in most martial arts styles. A black belt or a first degree or a first dawn is considered a beginning disciple. It's a follower of the way, a follower of the art. Again, not just the physical techniques, but the way of life. So you begin to follow the master, whoever that instructor is, whatever his rank is. So as I did this, I wanted <coughs> to be a official a disciple. I wanted the title of a disciple. And my instructor had told me that to achieve that, the training and the focus of training had to begin to be purely on chi, on the internal strength. So all of my focus, all of my attention da, began to be in any art that I was training in. How is this art related to chi? How can I use this art to achieve these supernatural abilities? abilities? The Shaolin Temple says in their own writings that the relationship between a master and his disciple is stronger than that of blood. So through this practice, and, and with me it was five, six days a week, I went to church once a week on Sabbath. The rest of the time I was training martial arts. Whenever I was out with my friends, it was about martial arts. Everything became martial arts focused. As I was being drawn deeper into the martial arts, I was being pulled slowly away from the bonds of my family. I can remember when it would be my anniversary, my wedding anniversary, and I would tell my wife, Let's do it the next day because I've got something really important in the arts that have to be done that night. Um, so we would postpone things with my wife and children in order that I could put the martial arts first. I remember one weekend, my wife and I were sitting there talking and she told me that she'd had a dream. Yeah, and I've, I've never really you know, given much credit to dreams. I mean, they're just dreams. My wife was very concerned about this. She said, Eric, she said, this was from the Lord. She said, I saw the high ranks at your school. And she said they were all standing in a circle with their arms linked one to another. And she said, behind them, on the outside of the circle, I saw the wives and the mothers and the children. And it was as though the circle was growing tighter and the families were being pushed to the outside. After my wife shared with me this dream, and I could tell that it bothered her you know, tremendously, I became angry. And I didn't realize it then, but I do now. There was a division of loyalties. I felt like she was trying to pull me away from this thing that, that had meant so much to me, this art that had, had filled my life. Da, and I clar, became angry. Artele marțiale le izolasele de familie. I began training even harder, determined not to allow anything to stand between me and the dreams of my youth. But it was I who did not understand, for I had allowed my own da, selfish desires doctor. to come between my wife and I. If only I had listened in faith and obeyed the word of the Lord, that life-giving word which is still speaking to each of us today. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved his church and gave himself for her. This is the battle that faces every man, to love his wife, his children, and to love all others above himself. In frustration and rebellion, I turned away from the one that was calling for my heart not realizing that it is only through this surrender that victory and freedom are finally won. The night which I longed for finally came. Two of us were to be recognized and awarded the title of disciples in Kung Fu. It was a private ceremony, one which only the high ranks were permitted to attend. And now, after training and teaching for 17 years in the martial arts, myself and the man whom I had first seen awarded the coveted black belt were now being honored with the rank equivalent of a fifth dawn. I remember the Grand Master when he walked in to the discipleship ceremony, myself and that gentleman that had made advanced brown belt that I had fought in the beginning. Both of us made disciple the same night. 
we were the first ones in over 30 years to make that rank. It was a, the equivalent of a fifth degree, a fifth dawn. When the Grand Master walked in, he had this huge staff in his hand. And there was hair, horse hair, coming out of it. And there were carvings on the side of it. And after the ceremony, when everyone was gone, you know, we asked him about that. You know, where did that come from? I'd been there for all these years and never seen that even in display. And he told me, he said, that staff was used only when someone made a disciple. And I know now that that was a shaman's staff. Even though this man loved the Lord, you know, was a professed Christian, he was blending light and darkness together. After that point, we had a private lesson with him that week after that ceremony. And this, the Grand Master told us something that I'll never forget. He looked at, at me and the other gentlemen there and he told us, he said, what you all are learning to do now, you would be considered wizards if this was done a hundred years ago. For the last two and a half years, myself and the other disciple had trained in ways I could have never before imagined. We spent hours each day meditating, standing in a low horse stance upon balance beams and Shaolin plum flower poles, striving to tap into and harness this mystical power called Qi. Through meditation, deep breathing, and visualization techniques, we were taught to change the temperature of our bodies and through the power of our minds to influence and control both our environment as well as those with whom we fought. To advance in this training, I was required to compromise the very clear instructions of the Word of God. And with each further step I took on this path of disobedience, my heart grew harder and my ears more deaf to the voice of my Father's love. God's Word being removed, the foundation of my life began to crumble beneath me and our family and home was being swept away in the storm. The ties which had bound me to my Savior and the covenant with my wife slowly had been eroded away. During this time, after I'd made my discipleship, my marriage and my family began to become very shaky. And I was battling with something inside that I couldn't voice to others. Everything that I was going through with this fight of staying married, of fighting for my wife, fighting for my children, and then the martial arts pulling me the other direction, this was harder than any battle that I had ever faced before. And nothing that the martial arts had taught me gave any hope of freedom or victory in this fight against sin. In the martial arts, they told us that everything was okay in moderation. There were no absolutes. There was no absolute black and white. Everything had a relative gray. The Word of God tells us clearly that no man can serve two masters. And for more than 16 years, I had attempted to do just that. While attending church each week with my family, my heart had been slowly drawn away from the things of the Lord and my home. I had allowed the martial arts and the desires of my own carnal heart to come between my wife and I and the covenant which I had made to her and to my God. This was perhaps the greatest battle I had ever faced. Through the years of my training in the arts and full contact fighting, I thought I had prepared myself to face any conflict. But now I realized that none of the Master's teachings nor the training of the flesh had prepared me for this. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in the heavens, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, not only in the church, but in our homes, and even within our own lives does this battle wage. The enemy I was now facing was within my own heart and mind, and I knew not how to free myself from my own selfish desires and the flesh nor from the voices I had listened to and obeyed for so many years, voices which speak to each of us every day, through television and movies, through music and the printed page, and the voices which had spoken to me through the grandmasters and teachers of the arts which I practiced. The Lord promises us 
that the weapons of our warfare are not weak and carnal, but they are mighty and full of power through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, the stronghold of lies which the devil whispers in our ears, casting down imaginations and every high thing which exalts itself against the knowing of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the perfect obedience of Christ. But how few avail themselves of that victory which the Lord Jesus Christ is waiting and ready to freely give. To be a genuine Christian, truly a disciple and follower of the Lord, means more than just believing in Jesus. It means more than just attending church once a week and reading a few verses in the morning before you rush out into the world. The Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, is not asking for 70% of your life. To be truly born again costs everything. It will cost you your life. The martial arts had taught me to look inward to myself rather than upward to Christ. To follow my feelings rather than the instructions of God's holy word. And now there was a war taking place. A war which began more than 6,000 years ago in heaven. And although unseen to the common eye, this war rages with intensity within every man, woman, and child. For there are people struggling in darkness, battling with internal foes, all around us each and every day. There are souls that are starving for the bread and the water of life, waiting, longing for someone who truly believes the words of Christ and who knows His love and great power to deliver and to save. Now, when I needed the Lord the most, when I needed clear discernment, and to know and to hear His voice, I had become both blind and deaf to His Spirit's instruction. Although I wanted a solution to the problems in our marriage, I could no longer read and understand the Scriptures as I once had. Light had become darkness to me, and evil now appeared as good. For the Bible says spiritual things can only be spiritually discerned. I had spent so many years listening to, reading, and hearing the voice of the serpent through the martial arts, my instructors, and the media that I could no longer discern the voice of my Father in heaven as He spoke through His holy word. For the carnal mind and the flesh is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. I fought the battle going on in my mind for almost six months but I fought it only as I had been taught in the arts, by the power of my own will and flesh. And regardless of the training, no man is a match for Satan and his legions of fallen angels without Christ. In frustration, I yielded to the voice of the dragon and my own selfish desires for freedom, and I filed for a divorce. I cannot put into words how our family was broken. When yielding to the carnal desires of one's own heart, Rather than the Word of God, few realize the lives their decisions will affect for eternity. For the no, heart is part of the above the... all things, and who can know it? I, I just remember so clearly that last day when I drove the moving truck to our country home to pick up the remaining furniture that I was taking with me. And as I pulled out of our gravel driveway, I did not see my wife and small son as they stood in the doorway crying out to the Lord in heaven for His mercy and help. Nor did I see the six-year-old little girl running behind my truck crying, Daddy, Daddy, wait! Please don't leave! It wasn't until years later that I realized what my leaving had done to my wife and children's lives. My wife Sarah began to fight the fight of faith, refusing to believe that the Lord would not keep His word. She daily claimed His promises, repeating out loud, What the Lord hath joined together, let no man put asunder. For with the heart we believe unto righteousness, and with our mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever believeth on Him shall not be put to shame. And while my wife lost herself in the Lord, in her Bible and fasting and prayer, I plunged even deeper into the darkness of the arts which had been the dream of my youth, struggling, struggling to silence the voice of the Lord and my own guilty conscience. 
da I can remember seeing Sarah as she walked up the steps to my apartment to drop off our children. She looked so thin and fragile, and yet there was a joy in her eyes which I could not understand. She had found that for which I struggled so hard to apprehend. But no matter how far I ran, and regardless of the entertainment and distractions the devil used to occupy my time, when I lay down alone at night, the silence was deafening. Oh, that thou hadst hearkened unto my commandments, for then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. For great peace have they that love my law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble and fall. As I sought for deeper knowledge and power from the martial arts, I also began training more heavily in the Chinese internal styles of Tai Chi Quan, Bagua Zhang, and Qi Gong. I remember the weekend when an accomplished martial artist and close friend of mine invited me to attend a training seminar which his Grand Master was holding in a city but a few hours from where we lived. I was excited about the prospect of meeting this man, a man of his rank and reputation, and even more so because he was known for his ability in both demonstrating and teaching the use of internal strength, or Qi. This man was recognized as a tenth Don in two systems of Kung Fu, and a master teacher in Chinese Qi Gong, a system which has as its sole purpose the martial and medical development of Qi power and energy. After the day's training was over, the Grand Master came and spoke with a small group of students from the area. He gave instructions to the black belts and their pupils in regard to their training, which they quickly left to complete. Once alone, the Grand Master addressed me personally, and although we had never met before, he told me that it was not by chance that I was there that day. For according to an old Chinese proverb, when the student is ready, it is then that the master will appear. From that day forward, I looked for every opportunity to train under this man. For not only did he have the knowledge to teach me, but he also had the authority to ensure my progress in the ranks above fifth dawn. Of all that I learned during those years, one thing stands out in my memory to this very day. Late one night after a hard day of training, he began to speak of the riddle of internal energy and chi, and how this power was achieved. But to my surprise, instead of telling of ancient Chinese warriors and sages, he spoke of the artistic ability of many of today's modern musicians, men such as Clapton, Hendrix, and others. He compared the energy which we were taught to use in Kung Fu to that which these legends of rock and roll channeled while playing the most sensual and ungodly music. It was then that I was told that to the beginner, Qi is known simply as internal strength, while at the intermediate levels, Qi is taught to be breath, and at the final level, Qi is revealed to be spirit. And it is this spiritual energy which is manifest in a thousand different forms. To the martial artist, it is used for speed and power. To the holistic healer, it is used to channel vibrational energies to heal. For the corporate executive and leader, it is used to influence and manipulate those beneath him. To the actor, it is used to mesmerize their audiences. While for the musician, this spiritual energy is used to inspire and to quicken their performance and control the minds and emotions of their listeners. After a few years under his instruction, I was soon impressed that if I was truly going to learn what this man had to teach, I could no longer serve two masters. After all, it was common for disciples to step out from under the covering of their original teacher in school and begin teaching on their own, and this I did. Now, feeling freedom to learn unhindered by divided loyalties, I began seeking to understand the hidden thread which is woven throughout all the Eastern arts, a power whose results could be seen, but whose source remained ever elusive and concealed beneath a veil. I often made the long six-hour drive to the city where my new teacher lived and taught. And it was on one such visit that I went to the Grand Master's home. It was here that I learned the secret for which I and disciples around the world had fought and trained for so many years. 
As I entered his home, I saw that which was most unexpected. Instead of images of Shaolin warlords long dead and monks in their traditional robes and sashes, I saw hanging upon the walls of every room tall, life-size tapestries of the Hindu gods and deities. Alarms were sounding in my mind, echoes of the scripture warnings I had been taught as a child, echoes which I sought to ignore. The Grand Master asked me that day a very puzzling question. He said, if all martial arts begin at Shaolin, which I knew they did, then why do we see such different expressions of that one and same art? I was stunned and yet intrigued, for this was that very question for which I had sought an answer all of these years, yet had never been able to put into words. How did he know to ask me that question? The alarms rang louder in my mind. The year was 2007. I had achieved everything that I'd ever dreamed of in the martial arts. One night I was teaching a class in the Chinese style called Ba Gua Zhang. It's very much like Tai Chi. All the movements are very slow, very precise. There's a lot of deep breathing, um, internal meditation, focusing within as you do the movements of the form. As I was doing this form, I was leading my students through the motions in a circle. And as we circled, we would focus on breathing and certain hand gestures called mudras. Then, as we completed the circle, we would reverse and go the opposite way. As I was doing this, I looked into the eyes of my students. I was looking to see if they were really tapping into that power that the martial arts is supposed to reveal, is supposed to impart to you. As I looked in their eyes, I noticed that almost every one of them was in a trance and they were drenched in sweat. Now because of the martial arts training, I knew that this is not possible, humanly or physically speaking. We had not done anything to, to bring the body to a sweat. We had not done anything physical. There was no calisthenics. At that moment, my mind was taken above what we were doing. And as I was teaching this form, it was as though I was looking down from above and I was seeing a design or a pattern that we were forming on the floor of the dojo. This had never happened to me before. It was very much like a, like a farmer with crop circles. When he walks out into his field, he just sees a mess. But if he sees it from above, from an aerial view, you can see a distinct pattern. The pattern that I saw was a circle with a dot right in the center, much like a bullseye. The thing that I struggled with was that I had seen this same symbol in all of the martial arts literature, the writings, the books of the masters and grandmasters. I went home that night and I went through my library, searching through Aikido books, the Japanese styles, through the Kung Fu and Qigong books, the Chinese internal styles. In every style that I looked, I found that same symbol. And I also found the meaning of that symbol. The symbol meant the sun god or the Tao. I was not sure how to tell my students. I mean, how do you tell close to 100 people that an art that we had been teaching at the school was actually invoking the spirit of the sun god. So the next week at my advanced class, the high rank class, I told my students I had a homework project for them. I wanted them to go home and do research on this symbol. So I drew the symbol on our chalkboard and I gave them their assignment. The following week when I came in, it was like dead silence. You could have heard a pin drop. Each one of those students was very solemn. I asked them to get up and present before the class what they had found. And when I'd given them this assignment, I told them that it didn't matter where they found their information. I just wanted to see what they could find on that symbol. They looked in 
history books. They looked in Aztec and Mayan writings. They looked in Egyptian um, hieroglyphics. They looked in Greek, Roman. They looked in Babylonian. They also looked in tattoo books. They looked in books on Wicca and witchcraft. And each one of them, one after another, got up and presented the information they had found. And all of them, regardless of the source, found the same thing. The symbol of the sun god, or the Tao, or yin and yang, as it is known in the Chinese. After doing this, after realizing what this symbol really stood for, one of my students asked, what does this mean? What are we going to do? How does this change what we're doing? And I told him from that point on, we would no longer be teaching that class. We would no longer be teaching the art of Bagua. But as I went home that night, I knew that there was more than what I had just seen. So I began searching through all of the studies that I had, that I had done, all of my books and literature on the internal martial arts of Tai Chi and yoga and Qigong and even the Shaolin arts. And as I searched, I began to realize that there was more working within these arts than I had wanted to believe. Memories of my mother's apprehension and discernment when I took that first step on that night so long ago. Now it was becoming clear that the spiritual forces which enabled the abilities in the arts I had practiced had also wrought in my family's destruction. But now the Lord was calling me. My son, it is time to come home. He was fighting to set me free from the chains of the world and revealing to my wife and children the power of his unfailing word. And as the Lord was reuniting our marriage and family, he was also restoring sight to my blinded eyes. Within a week, I made the announcement to my student body that we were no longer going to be offering or teaching the internal arts such as Tai Chi, Qigong, Bagua, and even Shaolin Kung Fu. Now I was trying to separate and divide the martial arts physical from the martial arts spiritual. This was very difficult. I attempted it for probably six or seven months. At the end of seven months, I realized that you cannot separate the spiritual roots of martial arts from their physical practice. Correct. When I made this announcement to my students, I lost probably 40% of my student body. This, um, it hurt financially, but it also hurt to know that I had lost students, some of which had been with me for many years. One night I came home from teaching class. It was late, probably 11.30, almost 12 o'clock. I walked in the door, and as I walked through the kitchen, I remember setting down my gym bag, my workout bag, you know, beside the doorway. I stepped over to the refrigerator to get something to drink. As my hand reached out to open the refrigerator door, the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. I felt an enormous presence behind me something that terrified me. After all these years in martial arts and full contact fighting, I thought I wasn't afraid of anything. What this was behind me terrified me. I didn't know what to do. It was like in that moment, all these thoughts, all the teachings of the masters I had read and studied under went racing through my mind. Do I fight? Do I run? But neither one would have done any good. Both were futile. And I was scared to turn around. I did not even want to see what this was that was towering behind me. It felt like it was 10 or 12 feet tall. It was enormous. At that moment, I heard a name sounding in my ears. The name of Jesus Christ. And as I heard that name, there was a spark, a spark of hope. And I thought, is it possible that he would save me even after everything that I've done, even after the, the pain and the hurt that I've caused my family and others? Will he save and deliver me? In Acts chapter 2, 
we have been given the promise that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, Adonai, the sovereign king, shall be delivered. I thought, can it really be that simple? Is it possible? Will he really hear and come to my rescue? In that moment, I fell to my knees. I looked up and I cried out with all that I had within me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, Yeshua, save me. I don't know how long I cried. Tears were, were rolling down my face. I could still feel that presence behind me and I just kept calling on the name of Jesus Christ. After what seemed like an eternity, I felt something else enter the room. It was as though a hand grabbed this thing that was behind me, this spirit, this demon that was standing behind me and flung it out of the room. I didn't see anything, but it was as though you could feel it. I was you know, covered in tears and I was crying out to the Lord. At that moment, I came to know the Lord as my personal Savior. At that moment, the Lord had shown Himself that He was mighty to save. Sabe, vedeți, rugăciunea soției și până la urmă faptul că l-a chemat pe Domnul Iisus Hristos într-un moment foarte nasol. Da, deci... Uh, omul este ori mem- membru în... Uh, Marte de omul, ba, ori un grup neoprotestant. Domnule, dar l-a chemat pe Iisus Hristos, asta contează și... A ales, uh, a ales pe Iisus Hristos în, uh, yoga de, has in the last în defavoarea artelor marțiale. Meditate a certain kind of spirituality. The spirit that I received from the masters and I trained under some of the best in the world. Uh, that spirit was one of violence. It was different. It's limiting to just label it martial arts. It's just a way of life. It helps you really definitely go emotionally, definitely even spiritually. Buona trevare. Amestecăm lumina cu întunericul. Da, partea a doua o să vă prezint secretele din, și, din spatele artelor marțiale. Va fi următorul episod. Mulțumesc! Mulțumesc pentru vizionare! Doamne ajută!